Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. God, as we examine the scriptures together, Lord, I pray that you would open our minds and open our hearts to receive the message that you have for us. I pray that you would speak to us now. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you most of all for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Max Lucado tells the story of being dropped by his insurance company because he had one too many speeding tickets and a minor fender bender that wasn't his fault. One day he received a letter in the mail informing him to seek coverage elsewhere. As he reflected on how he wasn't good enough for his insurance company, the spiritual tie-in was too obvious. Many people fear receiving such a letter from God, Lucado writes. Some worry they already have. Lucado then imagines this correspondence straight from the Pearly Gates underwriting division. Dear Mrs. Smith, I'm writing in response to this morning's request for forgiveness. I'm sorry to inform you that you have reached your quota of sins. Our records show that since employing our services, you have erred seven times in the area of greed, and your prayer life is substandard when compared to others of like age and circumstances. Further review reveals that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20th percentile, and you have excessive tendencies to gossip. Nobody here can relate to this, I'm sure. Because of your sins, you are a high-risk candidate for heaven. You understand that grace has its limits. Jesus sends his regrets and kindest regards and hopes that you will find some other form of coverage. This is how it goes for a slave who constantly lives in fear, not knowing enough, not doing enough, not ever measuring up. Have you ever felt like that? I believe that there are so many people in our world today who don't feel like they can rest secure in anything. People struggle in the current economic environment wondering if their jobs are secure. Many people live uncertain lives day to day knowing their boyfriend or girlfriend was willing to move in with them, but was unwilling to commit to them in marriage. It seems like there is so much that upends our sense of security, whether it's foreign powers, or pandemics, or hurricanes, or earthquakes, or any number of things. In unsecure times, what can you turn to? In unsecure times, who can you turn to? We are finishing up our series on 1 John this morning, and we will be in chapter 5 this morning. 1 John chapter 5. And as I read and reread our text this morning, this week, I was struck by a simple truth. We can rest secure in Jesus. Is there anybody here that needs to hear that this morning? It's not fancy, it's not elaborate, but it's true. Yes, there is someone you can rest secure in. There is certainty, there is comfort, there is peace, there is a firm foundation for you to stand on. We can rest secure in Jesus. Let's take a look at the text together. We're going to start at 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 13. Let's take a look together. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, 
He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So it's a pretty remarkable section of verses that we're starting with. When you believe in Jesus, you can approach God with confidence, knowing you have eternal life. When you believe in Jesus, you can approach God with confidence, knowing you have eternal life. If you take a look at these verses, and he starts off in verse 13 by saying, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The author is telling us why he's writing these things, why he's written this letter. It's so that everyone who knows, who believes in the name of the Son of God, everybody who believes in Jesus, who has placed their trust in him, you can know that you have eternal life. If you look at the previous verses, uh, right prior to this one, it talks about that. It talks about having eternal life. John did not want to leave us in doubt of our spiritual state. When you have placed your trust in Jesus, you have eternal life. We can have confidence in approaching the God of the universe. What a wonderful promise that is. It would also be easy to misunderstand something in these verses. It doesn't just say that we can ask for anything and we get it. It doesn't say that. That would be nice, wouldn't it? The prayer request at the end of the service might include some requests for winning the lottery, a new car, maybe a new boat. But no, there is an important phrase that we should miss. According to his will. Did you see that there in the text? This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will. It's an important phrase for us not to miss. This is an important part of maturing as a follower of Christ. Our lives become less about what we want and more about what he wants. What we ask for is for his will to be done. The insecurity that so often accompanies people in this life begins to fade away in light of these verses. We rely on the promises of God that when we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. We approach God's throne with confidence, knowing this. When we go to God in prayer, we do so with confidence because we know we are asking for his will to be done. Let's take a look at the next few verses, starting at verse 16. It says, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. <clears throat> For brothers and sisters struggling with sin, lift them up in prayer. For brothers and sisters struggling with sin, lift them up in prayer. When the Bible, uh, what the Bible is talking about, uh, life and death here, we can tell from the context that it is talking about eternity. Eternal life and eternal death, salvation or condemnation. These verses can be a bit challenging to understand. After all, elsewhere in the Bible, we read that the wages of sin is death. So how can there be sin that does not lead to death? When does sin not lead to eternal death? When does sin not lead to condemnation? Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says this, Repent, <clears throat> repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. 
If a person's sins can be wiped out by repentance, then it can be understood that sin that does not lead to death is any sin you can repent from. The sin that does lead to death is the sin that you don't repent from. There are examples given in Scripture. Jesus spoke of a unique, unforgivable sin, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Religious leaders in his day saw the work of Jesus in rescuing people from evil spirits. They should have known that this could only be the work of God. Instead, they attributed this to Satan, and Jesus called this unpardonable. But what else goes with the idea of not seeking repentance? It is the willful, continual rebellion against God. Perhaps a person embraces a particular sin, celebrates it, calls it good, in spite of what they know the Bible teaches about it. Perhaps they even try to twist the scriptures to fit the sin that they want to commit. What they won't do is repent. It is possible for a person's heart to become so hardened against God that they are no longer listening to Him. But here the Bible also says that for the person whose sin does not lead to death, this is the person with remorse over their sin that leads to repentance. The Bible urges us to pray, and God will give them life. And if you are on doubt on where a person is at, if you see a brother or sister struggling with sin, pray for them and let God work on them. For brothers and sisters struggling with sin, lift them up in prayer. Let's take a look at the next few verses, starting at verse 18. It says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come, and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. And that's the way the book ends. Rest secure in the protection of the understanding and the salvation that comes with being a child of God. I always love when I come to a section of Scripture in the New Testament where it talks about us being children of God. I know that there's a baby on the way in the church. I feel like that baby is pretty lucky. He's going to have some uh, pretty awesome parents. He's going to get to be a part of the Rose family. That's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be an experience. <laughs> but just think about who your spiritual heavenly father is. We get to be children of God. Every time I come to that phrase in scripture, I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful reminder of who you are when you accept Jesus as your Savior. Rest secure in the protection, the understanding, and the salvation that comes with being a child of God. If you belong to the world, your view of sin and righteousness can easily become clouded. The Bible speaks about how a person can be a slave of sin. But you don't have to be that. When a person accepts Christ, they don't go on living in rebellion against God. They repent and their life Changes. They turn and go a new direction. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. You don't continue to live in open rebellion against God. There may be stumbles along the way, but you ask forgiveness and you get back on track. And God gives so much to his followers. He gives protection. He gives understanding. He gives salvation, eternal life. 
And what does Satan give when you choose the world over God? Emptiness. He can't compete and he knows it. What he is offering is a poor substitute for what God offers. Those temptations that he offers, they may look good at first, but eventually you find out that it always leaves you empty. What he is offering is a poor substitute for what God offers. At first, when you are reading the text, you might be confused about that last line, too. Did you notice it said, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. We haven't really been talking about idols. And all of a sudden, the last line, it's like John had a little bit of extra room on the paper. He's like, I want to put that line in there. <laughs> Why does the Bible all of a sudden mention keeping ourselves from idols? Well, idols can definitely be the graven images and statues of people often worshipped in place of God, but they can be anything that we put in the place of God. The Bible is clear in this verse, when it comes to God, accept no substitutes. The world and all of its attractiveness and the temptations that it offers, it may look like a good substitute, but it is a poor substitute. Have you ever called a big company and you can't seem to talk to an actual person? You get an automated voice and sometimes it is the most frustrating experience. You hear phrases like, Listen closely as our menu options have changed. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Let's try again. And my favorite, your call is important to us. <laughs> Apparently not important enough to hire someone to answer the phone. My point is that sometimes an automated voice can be a poor substitute for a real person. In the end, the world is a poor substitute for God. Rest secure in the protection, the understanding, and the salvation that comes with being a child of God, and understand that what he offers is so much better than every alternative. Many mothers attend their children's graduation ceremonies, but I heard of one that was a little different. Judy O'Connor had a much closer view than most parents because she pushed her son, Marty, across the stage to receive his MBA from Chapman University. You see, her son was a quadriplegic. Before she left the stage, to her surprise, she was asked to come back. She was asked to come back because of what she had done. Years prior, Judy was living in Florida when Marty fell down a flight of stairs. Judy then moved to Southern California to be close to him, to help him. Through every challenge, she was there with him. She pushed him all over campus. She attended every single class with him, writing down every single note for him. She was there for every homework assignment. She was there for every test. The graduation announcer spoke as he struggled to get the words out through tears. The school's faculty, administrators, and board of trustees had decided at the suggestion of her son to give Judy an honorary MBA as well. The stunned mother was handed the MBA as the crowd rose to give her a standing ovation. That kind of devotion deserves to be recognized. Did you know that you have somebody like that in your life too? Through every challenge, he is there with you. He attends every day of work and school with you. He's there with you at the doctor's office. He's there with you when you have to pay bills. He's there with you when you're happy. And 
he's there with you when you're sad. He'll never leave you or forsake you. You can rest secure in him. We can all rest secure in Jesus. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are always with us. You promise to never leave us, never forsake us. And for that, we are thankful. We're thankful that no matter how scary life seems sometimes, no matter how uncertain it seems at times, we know that you're always with us. We know that you love us unconditionally. We know that you are willing to go to the cross to save us. Lord, we thank you for that constant love and your constant presence in our lives. We thank you that we are never, ever alone, no matter what is going on in our lives. Lord, we thank you for your love, and we just want to express our gratitude this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen.